Welcome everyone. I'm Carol Becker, Dean of Columbia University School of the Arts. Columbia University School of the Arts recognizes Manhattan as part of the ancestral and traditional homeland of the Lene Lenape and Wapinga people. By acknowledging legacies of displacement, migration, settlement and occupation, we are taking a small first step toward the long and overdue process of healing and repair. The School of the Arts continues to address issues of exclusion, erasure, and systemic discrimination through ongoing education and a commitment to equitable representation. This roundtable is part of the School of the Arts Spring Public Program and Engagement Series organized around the theme of repair. And for the past two years, we've been presenting conversations, screenings, readings, immersive installations, and performances that engage social and political initiatives committed to reimagining and repairing humanity's frayed relationships with other species, the planet, and ourselves. This is the second roundtable on the topic of reparative memory. And at this moment, as we watch the terrible devastation and also remarkable Ukrainian resistance to Russian aggression, and as we have tracked so many catastrophic recent events in other parts of the world, as well as in our own country, we know that the repercussions of all these events will not be easily absorbed and forgotten. The topic of repair, memory, and memorialization, therefore, could not be more timely. We have proudly organized these roundtables in collaboration with the Zip Code Memory Project. And for these roundtables, we have asked the following questions. How can the devastating but radically disproportionate losses caused by the ongoing global COVID-19 pandemic be memorialized? While acknowledging the social inequities and injustices the pandemic has exposed, might local memories of loss and neglect be transformed into a practice of justice and collective healing? What aesthetic memorial forms and strategies of engagement best foster the work of repair? Tonight's roundtable will approach the urgency of such challenges in conversation between noted artists who have responded to histories of violence by engaging communities in participatory memory projects in different geopolitical contexts. Their visionary work has mobilized painful memories, leaving space both for mourning and for imagining potential futures. Each artist will share their process and the challenges faced in creating communities of memory. This roundtable is co-presented by Columbia University School of the Arts, the Institute for Religion, Culture, and Public Life, the Society of Fellows and Heyman Center for the Humanities, the Zip Code Memory Project, and the Center for the Study of Social Difference. I'm now going to introduce to you two moderator panelists who, in collaboration with other writers and artists and local community members, have conceptualized and actualized the Zip Code Memory Project, Marianne Hirsch and Diana Taylor. Marianne Hirsch is the William Peterfield Trent Professor of English and Comparative Literature and of Sexuality and Gender Studies at Columbia University. <clears throat> she writes about the transmission of memories of violence across generations, combining feminist theory with memory studies within a global perspective. Her many books include Family Frames, Photography Narrative and Post-Memory, The Generation of Post-Memory, Writing and Visual Culture After the Holocaust, Ghosts of Home, The Afterlife of Chernovitz in Jewish Memory, and School Photos in Liquid Time, Reframing Difference. And these last two were co-authored with Leo Spitzer. Marianne is also co-editor of the collection of essays, Women Mobilizing Memory. She is one of the founders of Columbia's Center for the Study of Social Difference. She's a former president of the Modern Language Association and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Diana Taylor is a university professor and professor of performance studies in Spanish in New York University. She is the author of multiple books, among them Theater of Crisis, Disappearing Acts, The Archive and the Repertoire, Performance, and Presente, The Politics of Presence. She's co-editor of Holy Terrors, Stages of Conflict. Taylor was the founding director of the Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics from 1998 to 2020. She is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and other major awards, and she too 
who is president of the Modern Language Association and also has been inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And in 2021, she received the Edwin Booth Award for Outstanding Contribution to the New York City Theater Community and for the Integration of Professional and Academic Theater. So I'm now going to hand this over to Marianne and Diana. They're going to introduce our other panelists as well as the concept for the panel, and they're going to begin the conversation. Good evening. Let me uh, begin, first of all, by thanking the School of the Arts, Carol Becker, Gavin Browning, and everyone who's helped us put this roundtable together, but has also been uh, a wonderful partner in conceiving this series of conversations on reparative memory. Um, mm -hmm. Carol Becker mentioned some of our co-presenters, and I'd like to uh, join her in thanking them. The Zip Code Memory Project is truly a co collaboration among so many people. We're particularly grateful to the Luce Foundation um, for their um, generous sponsorship and the Center for the Study of Social Difference and so many others. Um, over the last few months, um, we've been gathering with a number of artists, activists, community members from Upper Manhattan and the South Bronx to create a space in which the losses occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic and the inequalities the pandemic has exposed so blatantly might be collectively acknowledged and addressed. How can we overcome the isolation we all experienced dur during the pandemic? How can we build trust and hope after so much loss? How will COVID be remembered and memorialized in the future? Our project is very small, it's local, it's intimate, but we've been so fortunate to be able to come together across these zip codes to mourn, to think, and to feel and create together, and also to articulate our hopes, our desires, and demands as we imagine repair. And in fact, Imagine Repair is the title of an exhibition and an event of public performances that we're currently planning on April 23rd. It will take place at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. Our exhibition will be on view until the 15th of May, and we hope that you will all join us please check our website for details. I'm now turning it over to my co-director, Diana Taylor. Hello, everybody. It's uh, lovely for us to be able to meet with you tonight and to host the second of these reparative memory roundtables. The first one we hosted was in the fall, and it's an interesting complement to this one. We planned them together. The first one uh, focused on Memorial memorialization that included or involved for the most part built structures. So we heard from Michael Arad and Doris Salcedo, Hank Thomas Williams, um, Thomas, uh, Hank Willis Thomas, and Mabel O. Wilson. And Susan Micellas, who is also one of the co organizers of our project, presented on a project that was less about built structures that more or less uh, announces what we're doing in this one. And in this one, um, we're going to be thinking about the, the same kinds, unfortunately, of you know, painful, painful pasts that we dealt with in, in the first round table, but this time we're looking more at memorialization through bodies. And one of the things that we're thinking is that we can, um, we can, the bodies also transmit these memories. They also take us back to a certain kind of um, way of knowing that even if we were not there, our bodies are taking these places, are standing in for, are standing alongside, are accompanying uh, the people who lost their lives in, in the ways that are being memorialized. So you'll see, for example, Mariana, and I will introduce our participants in a moment, but Maria Jose Contreras' project deals with the 1,200 people who volunteered to sit in, even for, she'll tell us, but just for a moment in a very long line, head to toe, to commemorate the people who were permanently disappeared by Pinochet's um, coup in, uh, in 1973. 
uh, come out where where it takes us and as strangers in a way to our own past and present to immerse ourselves in a history of racial violence directed at black New Yorkers. And our bodies connect with those who have been erased from history, omitted from the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And Rafael Lozano Hemer has done a lot of work in which he uses technology to help us stand with alongside those who have been either disappeared or, or excluded. So for example, in level of confidence, we look in a, at an image of one of the 43 students disappeared in Ayotzinapa in 2014, and we can see ourselves. In Bosalta in 2008, which was the 40th anniversary, again, like Maria Jose's 40 years later, but this time of the student massacre in Tlatelolco. And there people could talk um, and listen through these light, I don't know how he did it. He will tell us hopefully altavoces, which are loudspeakers. And of course the crack in the hourglass which we've seen at the Brooklyn Museum and that we will see again in our exhibit on April 23rd, um, highlights those lost to COVID. So we're talking about memorial, memorialization through bodies that connect us to our very often brutal pasts and yet affirm the capacity of us as humans to keep connecting and transmitting and making present or as I would say, presente, me and many others. Thank you. As Diana indicated, one of the things we're hoping for from these roundtables is to be inspired to think about how COVID itself will be commemorated. And we're looking at to these other histories to see how people have done it in other contexts. We will begin our roundtable with Maria Jose Contreras, who's a performance artist scholar from Chile, currently based in New York City. Her work has creatively explored the relation between the body, memory, and politics. And it's very much related to her life as, as she says, the daughter of the Chilean dictatorship, an event and an afterlife that's really shaped her practice. Um, she, Maria Jose Contreras is a performance artist, a dramaturg, a scholar and theorist of performance. She's taught theater and performance at the Catholic University in Chile, as well as at NYU, Columbia, and many other places. And she's published widely and internationally. A number of us here were really fortunate to collaborate closely with her on our project, Women Mobilizing Memory, and the book that Carol mentioned. She's one of the co-editors, along with me and several other people um, of uh, this book. She's also facilitated some fabulous body-making workshops for the Zip Code Memory Project, you saw us in the beginning, in the slides in the beginning, where with the participants in our project, she, um, she got us to draw and perform how we hold our memories of COVID in our bodies, in our homes, and in our neighborhoods. Uh, she will be speaking about Carrie Ann Nover, the project that Diana just mentioned on the streets of Santiago on the anniversary um, of the 40th anniversary of the coup. My pleasure and honor to introduce Kamau Ware, who is an award-winning multimedia artist who has developed what he calls meditative walking experiences to lead people through the history of slavery in New York City. Founder of the Black Gotham Experience in 2010, he tells stories drawn from historical and archival resources as he introduces his visitors, as I said, strangers, many of us, to the places where we live to places where major events of racial violence and exclusion against black New Yorkers took place throughout various periods. Most of us walking by are oblivious to the importance of these unmarked places. Why walking? Ware says, I love walking, an almost effortless act of balance, rhythm and strength that connects us to our oldest ancestors and creates a dialogue with the universe. Kamau's work ranges across different media from walking tours to video installations such as Black Solidarity and Fighting Dark to the graphic novel, The Other Side of Wall Street among other creative forms. Whatever the form, the impetus seems to be the same 
to connect Black New Yorkers to their history, to immerse everyone who will participate with them to the stories and legacies of Black experience so central yet so obfuscated in American life. Instead of waiting for people to come across this knowledge on their own or through our academic or cultural systems, Kamau generously invites us, takes us there, and helps us navigate this often terrifying history of US racial politics. And now it's with great pleasure that I welcome Rafael Lozano Hemmer to uh, close the round table. Uh, Rafael is a media artist who works at the intersection of architecture and performance art in Mexico City, in Montreal, and across the globe. In his memorial work, he's created platforms for public participation using technologies such as robotic lights, digital fountains, computerized surveillance, media walls, and telematic networks. Inspired as he writes by Phantasmagoria, by Carnival, by animatronics, his light and shadow works are what he calls anti-monuments for alien agency. And I found it absolutely fascinating how he's reappropriated and, re and resignified technologies that have been state technologies like surveillance cameras, facial recognition, in the interest of bringing to visibility memories and stories that would otherwise remain silent and invisible. And I think that's what that's one act that ties our, our three speakers together. Rafael is the recipient of two numerous awards to name. Let me just name two BAFTA, British Academy Awards for Interactive Art in London. He was the first artist to represent Mexico at the Venice Biennale, and his work has been shown again as two, at too many other biennales and museums around the world to name here. Most recently, he's had solo exhibits at the Hirshhorn Museum, He's had the inaugural show at the Amore Pacific Museum in Seoul and a mid-career retrospective um, co-produced by the Musée d'Art Contemporain uh, in Montreal and in, at SF MoMA. He's dedicated his work to powerful memorial projects to catastrophic histories uh, that some of which Diana has named um, in her earlier introduction. And, but he will speak tonight about um, his work about that, that tries to memorialize the losses of millions of lives to the COVID-19 pandemic, A Crack in the Hourglass, a project which is currently on view at the Brooklyn Museum. And we are really honored and thrilled to have a satellite installation at the cathedral for, at St. John the Divine at the Imagine Repair exhibit from April 23rd uh, to May 15th or beyond. And uh, you can actually participate in this project now. And I hope Gavin will put that into the chat. Um, so I'd like to now turn it over to Maria Jose Contreras. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Diana. Thank you um, to all the organizers. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. Uh, as the presenters, um, Introduce. I will be speaking about Querer No Ver, which is a collective uh, performance of memory that I convened, designed, curated, and uh, in which I participated, of course, in 2013. So before starting, just uh, we're talking here about memory, and it's very interesting to me to be thinking about this performance that happened nine years ago. So I have a, a, a distance and temporal distance and a memory about this memory performance. So, in 2013, 13, Chile commemorated the 40th anniversary of the state coup. That year, as 11th of September approached, that's the date when the government palace was bombed in 1973 by the military lead, uh, under the leadership of Pinochet, more and more content about the dictatorship flourished. Suddenly and surprisingly, everything was about the dictatorship. Open access television almost obsessively broadcasted documentaries, fiction series, and reportage about the dictatorship. Universities programmed seminars, conferences, colloquiums, and reflected on that difficult past. There was an overload of images and discourses about the dictatorship that privileged amount, frequency, and volume rather than content. A young student of mine told me they weren't interested in learning about the dictatorship. 
It's the same old soup. You people really need to move forward, he told me. The saturation of memorial discourses and images, instead of mobilizing practices that would allow working through and healing 40 years after the state coup, just perpetuated the indifference of a portion of the population and even produced rejection in the younger generations that didn't experience the dictatorship firsthand. What we lived in 2013 in Chile aligned with the perverse politics of memory prevalence since the so-called return to democracy in 1990. A politics of memory that advanced the idea of a national reconciliation founded on the amnesia of the past and the impunity of the perpetrators of violations of human rights. The national goal of reconciliation was, of course, closely tied to the installment of neoliberal economies in Chile. The price Chile paid for joining the club of prosperous economies in the Americas was amnesia and accountability impunity. The fiction of reconciliation was supported by the national narrative that the dictatorship and all its violent effects, effects were in the past. The saturation of images and discourses about the past past promoted the idea of a new Chile that could look backwards to a terrible but concluded and closed past. Chilean society was tempted to think that a closure was finally possible. But violent pasts such as a dictatorship, particularly without reparative justice, cannot be left behind. In 2013, just 76 ex-agents of Pinochet regime had been condemned, and of those, only 68 were actually in prison. As for many other people of my generation, the 40th commemoration felt like an uncanny dramaturgy of memory. I didn't quite know how to navigate this landscape. I attended seminars, engaged in conversations, and I confess, I even watched a complete fiction show television fiction show that portrayed a young and handsome lawyer that fought against the dictatorship, but all somehow felt displaced and distorted. One day in August 21st, 2013, General Cheide, who had been the commander in chief of the military in Chile from 20, 2002 to 2006, was interviewed in open television. Just a few minutes into the interview, this the obnoxious Cheide shamelessly said in an open televised interview that he was not aware of the violation of human rights that occurred in the same regiment where he served at the second, as the second person in command during 1973. Even if witnesses pointed to him as a torturer and an accomplice of the murder of at least 15 people, he had the nerve to deny not only his participation in these crimes, but also his knowledge about what was going on. I recall looking at the screen without believing what I was listening. My perplexity quickly transformed into rage. How could he not know what was going on if he oversaw the regiment? How can he lie like this on public TV? As my rage escalated, I started hearing in my head the voices of many people that during my life had told me that during the dictatorship, they didn't know people were tortured, kidnapped, murdered, murdered, or disappeared. Diana Taylor coined the notion of percepticide to explain why bystanders may deny the reality of violence. I will quote Taylor's uh, Taylor. The triumph of the atrocity was that it forced people to look away a gesture that undid their sense of personal and communal cohesion. Spectacles of violence rendered the population silent, deaf, and blind. People had to deny what they saw and by turning away, collude with the violence around them. That August 21st of 2013, I just couldn't remain indifferent to the perpetuation of the percepticide dynamics, couldn't tolerate the politics of amnesia and couldn't stay passive against the indifference. Those that said that during the dictatorship, they didn't know, just didn't want to see. Those that 40 years after the coup continued to affirm their ignorance, just didn't want to see. That's when I thought of doing something. As a performance maker, my response to percepticide was devising a collective participatory performance that I entitled Querer No Ver, not wanting to see.
December 10th, 2013. The streets of Santiago in Chile are crowded as they are every day. Only some police detachment distributed along the streets are evidence that this is not a usual Tuesday. You can breathe the tension in the city. It's just one day before the 40th anniversary of the state coup in Chile that occurred on 11 September 1973. The government and police forces are alert to possible demonstrations of or protests. At 8.49, 1,200 people interrupt their lives and make space for remembering. We lie down on the streets, creating a two-kilometer line running through the main street of the city from the Palacio La Moneda, the government building that was bombed by the military forces during the state coup, to Plaza Italia, one of the main squares of the city. Now, uh, Plaza Italia uh, is named Plaza Dignidad. People die la lie down for 11 minutes, evoking the 11th, as Chileans typically refer to the date of the coup. Present bodies, or should we say a present collective assembled body, conjure the missing bodies of the 1,200 detenidos desaparecidos during the dictatorship in Chile. Hundreds of bodies mobilized to expose what Chilean society insists in forgetting. The city stops for a minute. Police forces are perplexed. They do, don't know how to proceed. The line is too long. There are too many prone bodies. People don't know what is happening. Silence. At 9 a.m., hundreds of people rise and continue on their way through the city. This is a map uh, that illustrates the the how long the line was it's this two kilometer lines that would take uh, someone to uh, 26 minutes to walk from one end to the other querer no ver restituted the street as a political and aesthetic aesthetic arena one of pinochet's first bandos prohibited gatherings for more of more than three people in public spaces thus this collective action not only occupied the current street, but also symbolically occupied the street that 40 years ago was out of bounds. Querer no ver disrupted the way in which memory, the memory of the state group was being produced at that moment. It stood up to the apparent closer and served to remind people and reinforce the idea that some injuries are still open, that justice has not been done, and that there are still hundreds of Chileans missing. That morning in Santiago, 1,200 bodies resisted the naturalized indifference and chose to do something about it, to act, to put their bodies on the line. Querer no ver was sustained by bodily performativity as an alternative to the verbal and visual disposition that pre predominated in, com in the commemoration of the state coup. And this other way of remembering and commemorating resulted in an alternative dramaturgy of memory. In addition, Querer no ver gave citizens the opportunity to manifest the resistance to the way the memorialization process was being carried out. Many participants declared after the action that they were willing to participate in the, the reconstruction of memory, but didn't know how. The 40th anniversary reduced the space of participation to social media where people could, in tweet length reflections, make their opinions known. This outlet proved to be insufficient people felt the need to participate more actively in the reconstruction of their own past. Querer no ver encountered the desire to participate in the memorialization process, not only virtually, but also corporeally. Participation functioned at various stages, beforehand in curating the project and recruiting participants, during in the material action of that lying down and afterward in the spreading of thousands of pictures and videos made by the participants that expanded the life of the performance. The bodily performance of Querer no Ver allowed participants to some extent to overcome the vulnerability of a traumatic still present past. The performance drew a scar in the city, one that is not always visible but that persists haunting our present. That day, 1,200 people resisted the narrative that intended to bury the bodies of the desaparecidos in a fictional past and stood up, or should we say, laid down, to bring into presence the non-presence of the missing bodies. Querer no ver resisted vulnerability and, 
by assembling and mobilizing bodies empowered us to regain the possibility to construct an alternative memory of the past. When thinking about reparative memories, I think of collective practices of participation that allow effective connections. Reparative memories are not only about compensation, redemption, or restitution to the victims. They are also about building a community where victims, witnesses, and maybe even deniers can come together. One, one of the Querer No Ver participants wrote after the performance, lying on the cold pavement looking at the sky made me think about the desaparecidos, how they lived their last days and how they died. I never thought about that before feeling the indifference of some of people in the street who didn't even stoop, stop to look at us, I was able to feel in my own body the painful crusade that the relatives of the missing have passed through the, during the last 40 years while pleading for some information that may reveal where the bodies of their beloved are. Performance may mobilize reparative memories by allowing the effective attuning of bodies in co-presence. As the previous quote shows, these others are not only those that share the contingency of a present time, but also include those that are not longer here with us. Being a person born in the violent time of the dictatorship, I've come to realize that reparative memories are not possible if we think of time as a linear, unapologetic, and irreversible progression. Reparative memories thrive in heterogeneous temporalities that rebuild our past and recuperate our future. When devising performances of memories, I challenge myself to work in the gaps, detours, and fissures that escape the conventional imperative of time. Inhabiting and performing in those cracks, I found sometimes a shared disposition of hopefulness. Maybe that's when something like a reparative memory becomes possible. Thank you very much. And now I'll hand it to Camajo. Hello. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Maria. That was a fantastic uh, presentation, conversation. Uh, my name is Kamau, uh, founder of the Black Gotham Experience. I'm going to share my screen and talk a bit about some of the things that we've done recently and also some things we have coming up with respect to um, memory, repair, and the practice of archiving. And I wanted to just start uh, letting you know that I'm, I'm, I'm an artist first and foremost. I became a historian through this project, Black Gotham Experience. And, you know, at, as some may know, I'm actually surprised how often people are familiar with it. Uh, th this whole process started because listening is key. Uh, working at a museum here in New York in 2008 and was inspired by a question from a young girl who was asked a question about the presence of black stories in New York. And that just made me think about the importance of being able to have more regular conversations, more consistent protracted dialogue about the place of Black people in the story and the history of New York City. A lot of people often just begin the timeline in the well-documented Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s, not realizing how for 300 years Black bodies have been um, traversing this island. And so part of what is a, a key element of our practice is listening. And listening is something that you can do with your ears, but also something you can do with your body. And part of going through these erased narratives in Manhattan is, is using your body as an archive, not just as a place of memory and collection, but also a place of resonance. Putting your body in places where history took place and getting familiar with those energies. So while you're doing your research, you also have a way to consider how that feels when you walk through those various spaces. And one of the things that we're looking at doing right now is impacting the public square so that we can have different people have these experiences without having to do all the research but can be get pointed in the right direction to find out more information and here on this map i want to point out that this is bowery close to where uh, the bridge comes into canal street 
But here you see Catalina Anthony and Domingo Anthony are some of the uh, first black people in the town of the Netherlands to become landowners in 1643, which is 21 years before New York City is even created. And so part of what we're looking at doing is just reestablishing this notion of origins by showing that before there was a Royal Navy, before there was an American Revolution, before there were immigrants coming to New York in tenements in the 1800s, there were black people forming communities here on the island of Manhattan. And you can find this out by taking walking tours, but we wanna find ways to begin to mark these locations in the public square to generate more conversations and create some higher levels of understanding. And so one thing that we've done is find ways to take flags as a way to place them in locations and create new types of discussions. For example, this flag right here is using images that I've created with the number one and a three to symbolize the year 1643 when black land ownership began to take place. And by putting them on flags and moving them into locations, ideally making them permanent markers, we're subverting the idea of a flag that is more of a colonial land taking or oppressive symbol, but using a flag to invite people to conversations and utilize people living today in their body and their current archive to represent people who are not in the archive. So we're using art as a form of ceremony to bring people into the conversation and collect stories and make new stories for the future. This is another example of asking two people to stand in for two people who were enslaved by the Van Cortland family, where you now have Van Cortland Park on the last one uh, stop in, um, on the one train. And she's standing in for um, Hester and he's standing in for Piero. And this image was turned into a flag that now flies at the historic house in Van Cortland Park. And of course, I enjoyed the process and enjoyed seeing my work on display. But the day this actually was shared was a time when there was uh, on Juneteenth a recognition that there is uh, an actual African burial ground there on Van Cortland Park and they called the area Hester and Piero's Mill Pond. And there was an elder there who said they've been coming to this park for like 25 years and they've never seen an image of a black person fly over their head. And so she uh, thanked me for the work and I was just really humbled to have made something that touched somebody else. But it's this, on, it's, this, it's this ongoing way of building community and building art that commemorates places, but also asks people to participate and be a part of the project and be a part of the process. And speaking of um, memory and COVID, my studio created another project um, uh, that's called the Gallery Walk. And here in the seaport, we wanted to pause for a moment and, and think about what we learned from the pandemic. And this was last summer, this is before Delta showed up. And the, the Magic Hour was a way of considering uh, what it was like to be in New York during a pandemic, during a protracted um, time of dusk, where it can be a, a transition period, but also uh, a, a time of beauty and reflection. And it was interesting to have that process a bit disrupted by a new variant. But once again, we used the flag and the siren um, to look at not just the magic hour, but also to consider the symbolism of sirens and the sounds of the pandemic that is haunting a lot of our memory. And so we wanted to utilize art and flags and exhibitions as a way to bring people together and have conversations. One of the things we're working on right now, uh, we're working on marking the land of the Blacks and we actually were able to get a resolution passed by Community Board 2. And what we're looking at is using the maps and using people who play in the figures of these landowners to be turned into flags, but also we can take a football field size screen like at the Oculus and begin to populate those screens with images as well that create conversations about black landowners that existed before New York City was ever invented. Once again, using art as ceremony, asking people to step into the archive and play these historic figures and then put these images in the public square so people who are just traversing and moving about their day can can pause and have reflection and have things to think about. And so this is something that we're really enjoying. And we know that these are delicate, difficult subjects, but we're not really going to get anywhere avoiding them. And so we think that utilizing art and movement in the body is the way to begin to work these things, not just out of our physical bodies, but also out of the bodies of our communities and our society. 
And so there's a few other things here that I want to um, present, but I also want to just talk a bit about just why, you know, walking is also uh, a, a very important part of the process. Um, one thing that we're doing recently is working with the shed to produce this exhibition and video and audio walking tour that talks about um, what people call the draft riots. But if you actually walk around the locations where these draft riots took place, you can see that they're nowhere near where the actual draft took place on the east side of Manhattan. And if you actually do the research, you find out that the draft wheel was destroyed earlier in the morning on July 13th. And so you got to ask yourself, if we call it a draft riot, how come black bodies are being lynched and being set on fire on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday? And so part of this walk, that's a digital program. People can walk around the city and hear this narration and understand that sometimes we cover things up by not talking about it, but by moving through the city and this is an amazing city to walk through, you can begin to tap into those narratives and get these stories uh, portrayed in ways that are going to be resonant and very personal. And so walking and art really come together in an important way in our practice. And part of the aim is for people to begin to see themselves in history. This image was taken by somebody at one of our events, and we're looking at how somebody can look at a woman named Catalina Anthony, who became a landowner, um, July 13th, 1643, and, and, and see herself in that story, and to really elevate a range of narratives so that we all can appreciate that we're historic actors now. And when we talk about trauma, we talk about repair, it's important to understand our agency in moving the ball forward and being part of the healing process. And one thing that I've become as, a, as an evangelist of walking is somebody who likes to just nerd out and buy a bunch of books about walking. And I've even had a couple classes that's just about walking, not as much about history. And I, I come across this interesting report um, by these two psychologists who were talking about how, um, you know, pound for pound, if you could pick any kind of thing to do to stimulate your mind, walking outdoors is one of the most important things that you can do. And so we really educate our community. We really advocate in the work of making, you know, uh, art as ceremony to get outside and to, and, to, and to walk and to engage and to keep in mind that your body is an archive, that we contain more stories just in our bodies, more stories in our psyche than you could ever fit in a museum. And so bringing your bodies to places and then also marking those places just creates these very powerful vectors of memory making, of repair, but also adding an aesthetic to the urban spaces so that people can learn without you know, uh, having their feelings hurt but so much. Um, to quote Bob Marley, one of my favorite artists, um, you know, when music hits you, you feel no pain. We think that the aesthetics is a great way to have these conversations. And just to like wrap up, you know, we just had this exhibition um, at the Oculus on these screens. They were playing on the same screens that play ads. And so it's kind of like breaking into the matrix while people are, you know, presenting their different offerings to society. For like about 15 seconds every two minutes you get a chance to have these images that hearken you to understand there's more history in new york than you might realize and so we're having a good time healing and i think that joy is an important part of the exercise because sometimes people avoid these conversations because they don't understand the value in it and don't understand what's on the other side of the difficult conversation and on the other side of the conversation is healing but healing isn't always um uh, pretty. And so uh, we, we want to find a way to lean into these experiences with aesthetics, activate the body, activate the mind, activate the community, because we're not going to get as far as we can go if we don't go uh, together as a circle protecting all of our rights. And so with that said, um, happy to wrap up. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody and be a part of this presentation. The next person you're going to hear from is my new friend, Raphael. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, it's my delight to be here. Uh, really fascinating uh, presentations before me. Thank you for having me in this great context. Um, uh, today, I'm going to briefly speak about some of the practice uh, that my studio um, has been engaged in uh, to do with memorials. 
and uh, leading up to a project that I'm working on with a zip code memory project uh, relating to COVID-19 uh, uh, deaths. So um, I am a Mexican artist, but I live in Canada. I would like to share my screen. Uh, let's make sure that this works nicely. Excuse me. Okay, and all right. Can you um, confirm that you can see this? Looks beautiful, thank you. Perfect. So um, most of the artists that I admire do their best works when trying to deal with extremely egregious moments of historical injustice. This is uh, some footage from the massacre of students in Tlatelolco in 1968, about 10, 10 days before the Olympics were to start in Mexico City. The government, um, you know, basically was complicit in the murder of about 300 people, depending on who you ask. And the site of the massacre is a location which has been taboo. It was cleaned up. The, the media were not uh, involved in, uh, in reporting on this injustice. And 40 years later, UNAM University, uh, which took over the site of the massacre, invited artists such as myself to create um, some kind of memorial um, that would remember the, the, the killings. And so what we did was this. We built a megaphone that converted your voice into light. Bueno, mi comentario es acerca de la, digamos, la represión que vivimos en este momento. Los mártires, todas aquellas personas que lucharon, que vieron por el futuro, pues muchas veces los dejamos en el olvido. So as people would take a megaphone from the site of where the massacre took place, their voice would be beamed by a massive uh, robotic searchlight and flash their message to hit the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, people would approach the microphone without censorship or moderation. And over the period of about three weeks, every night, uh, neighbors, students, survivors of the massacre would approach the megaphone and speak their mind. The idea was to amplify participants' speech, to make it tangible, to make it material, so to speak. And this amplification was uh, related in part with, um, with the urban takeover. We wanted for this to be a beacon of, um, of speech. And the kind of speech that people um, brought to this piece was extremely moving. So over the weeks that the project was live, we had uh, survivors, we had a fellow who said, my name's so-and-so, and I'm here to um, say that I'm one of the uh, 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 sons of uh, one of the soldiers that committed the massacre. I've lived with this guilt all my life, and I want to say I'm a new generation. Um, you had, um, you know, manifestos, you had poems, you had all sorts of expressions that help the sense of mourning, which was denied by the order of events, which is basically that this was a taboo subject in Mexico for about um, three decades to speak about um, the Tlatelolco massacre. And so the project tries to bring people to come together. Uh, Frederick Chevsky, the American composer that recently died, um, underlines this objective as the most important part of art making is mourning, but also continuity. How can we come together, share an experience to give closure to events like this? So um, we had, uh, for example, not, not everything was sorrowful. Of course, we also had marriage proposals and we had beatboxers and rappers uh, take the microphone. But the idea is that the platform, the memorial is out of my control and cr critically out of the control of the authorities. Um, importantly, um, people, could talk not just about the massacre of Tlatelolco, but also about the massacre of Acteal or Aguas Blancas. I mean, there are so many other massacres that have been taking place in Mexico since the Tlatelolco ones, that it's important to talk about the, um, the memory of something that happened in the context of what's happening now. Now, as the light hit the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, three other lights would beam these messages up to the rest of the city in three directions. 
And another thing that we did in this project is we converted the voices into FM radio. So if you were in your home or your uh, school or your work and you would see this lights flashing, if you were driving in your car, you could tune in to 96.1 FM and listen live to what the lights were saying. So you could tune to what uh, the lights were saying. So this is... ...en Tlatelolco, octubre 2, 1968, y los culpables no han sido castigados. Todo el sistema judicial mexicano es visto por la ciudadanía, según todas las encuestas, como algo ajeno y contrario a ella. Ahí están las matanzas. So um, the project was a, also an intervention into the radioelectric spectrum. So seeing that also as a, a public space that needed to be taken over. And of course, because the piece was a radio program, if we ever had quiet, we would play back recordings from survivors, intellectuals, uh, artists, uh, neighbors of the time. So the idea is to, to perform the archive, to give the archive like a visible, urban, tangible presence, but then of course give priority to those who are speaking now. So as you take a microphone, you would, uh, you know, you would take priority both in FM and in um, in the night sky. The lights could be seen from a ten mile radius, and uh, yeah, they really represent this kind of beacon or or signaling. Um, something that's not as lugubrious. Um, for the uh, Havana Biennial, I made this project, which is basically Omara Portuondo, the singer for Buena Vista Social Club. And how do you remember somebody as magnificent, somebody as important, somebody who is the voice of Cuba? So we asked her to breathe into this brown paper bag. And then um, the project is called Last Breath. And it consists basically of a brown paper bag that has Omara's breath that is actuated by a custom respirator that we built that makes the bag inflate and deflate 10,000 times a day, which is the normal respiratory frequency for an adult at rest. And so the idea is that you can go uh, to the National Museum of Music in Havana and, uh, and see the last breath of Omara Portuondo. So even after she dies, this project keeps this outrageous or absurd uh, you know, moment, uh, we call it alito in Spanish, the air that comes out in this machine that tries to, to remember her. And then we've done that with many other artists and, and singers, this is Pauline Oliveros. So her last breath is in the SF MoMA. And this is Efraín Jara, who was an uh, uh, incredible poet from Ecuador. So uh, we took his breath for the Cuenca Biennial. And then finally, um, the breath of the great um, Montreal poet Nic Nicole Brossard, um, who is in the Museum of uh, Fine Arts here in Montreal. Um, after the 43 students of Ayotzinapa were kidnapped in Mexico and the official stories were not uh, believable, uh, I heard that the community was still looking for the 43 Normalista students and um, they were hoping to still find them alive. And so what we did in the studio is we have a variety of police grade uh, face recognition algorithms and we took them, we trained them with the 43 images of the normalistas. When you stand in front of this, of this piece, it tries to compare you to all 43 and it finds who you look like the most. Uh, so it says Martin Gersemani Garcia or whomever. And then it says our level of confidence is only 17%. Result, student not found. So the idea is to, to, to present um, uh, an empathic um, uh, mirror into, into uh, them, to do an interior search, to do a comparison be be between their biometrics and us, and critically, to inverse the role in which these technologies are used. Usually you're looking for the suspect, for the culprits, but we know where they are, they're in power. Um, and instead, we're trying to look for the victims, for the disappeared. Um, this project is free for anybody to download from my website, so it's a campaign, not an artwork, and we have shown it in over 100 cities 
all over the world and all over Mexico in with this kind of keeping alive of the search for the disappeared. And the project also exists in source code so that other artists or programmers can make their own versions. So indigenous artists here in Montreal are making a new version of this project, not looking for the 43 students of Ayotzinapa, but to look for the over 1,000 indigenous women that have been lost in the past 10 years and nobody knows where they are. So the project is, as a campaign, uh, a piece of code which can be reused by others. Uh, importantly, this project generates income. Whenever it's exhibited, we uh, send all of the proceeds of the exhibitions to the families of the disappeared uh, for them to pay forensic scientists or, or um, you know, their caravans or lawyers and so on. Five minutes remain. Five minutes remain. Um, a project called Border Tuner across the U.S.-Mexico border at the height of Trump's adversarial and racist, um, you know, uh, rhetoric. Uh, we had this project which would create three bridges of light across the U.S.-Mexico border that you can control from three stations in the U.S., three in Mexico. And basically there's a tuning device that allows you to turn this knob, this wheel, and with that, the searchlights would scan the horizon. And when your searchlights and somebody else's searchlights across the border would meet, the computer would know it and open a bi-directional channel of communication. So you could listen to the person and they could listen to you. If you didn't like what they were saying, you could just tune them out and look for somebody else. So over the period of a couple of weeks uh, with the University of Texas in El Paso, uh, Carrie Doyle, and, um, and also with uh, local artists in both sides of the border. Um, border Tuner was created to be like a switchboard of communication between the two sides. The project was extremely touching over, um, you know, we got over 10,000 people coming to it. And the idea is that this piece did not divide people, that the border was not dividing people, but it was bring them close together. Um, about 70% of the population has uh, family on the other side. And so they would, um, you know, they would sort of stage this impromptu talks. And sometimes people did, did not know who was on the other side and they would establish ad hoc conversations. A lot of them were very, very touching. Others were things like flirting or serenades, or we had all sorts of, uh, you know, activists doing manifestos. Um, we had one night where Adelitas Fronterizas on El Paso side was with Batallones Femeninos in Mexico. So, you know, feminist rappers. Another night was historians. Another night was uh, refugees or indigenous communities who would speak their mind. So basically the idea of presence, of being present and of establishing channels of, in, of exchange is what these kind of memorials are about. And again, there's, there's never censorship. There's uh, a sense of allowing people to, to, to self-represent in whichever way they can. And the kind of thing that you saw through projects like this is, um, you know, like for example, um, this person was a veteran of Vietnam War and he had been deported, for example. Uh, or you had like the mayor of El Paso, who was actually a Republican, but he was speaking about how, um, you know, El, El Paso and Juarez have been sister cities for 100 years before the U.S. was ever existing. Um, uh, or you'd have like indigenous communities speaking their own languages. Anyway, so the point is, projects like this are, um, are um, meant to be there uh, with crowdsourced content. So your memorial is just something that's living. It's a relationship. I think, I think more of a memorial as radio programs where something is always happening um, as opposed to something that, that is static and, and forever. So this is, um, finally, I want to show one last project, which is uh, Crack in the Hourglass. This is the project that was originally curated by Mwak Museum in Mexico City, and now it's at the Brooklyn Museum. And a satellite of it is going to be at the Zip Code Memory Project um, at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. But it's basically um, sand from an hourglass which falls uh, gradually and it's basically directed by a robot arm, a plotter, which drops the sand to make portraits of people who uh, perished due to COVID, sent by their family or friends over a website 
at crackinthehourglass.net. And then it takes about 20 minutes, 30 minutes to make a portrait. It invites people to watch a broadcast that's live on the website for people to be able to gather and see. Part of the problem with uh, COVID, as you know, is many people could not go visit their mom or, or their grandpa, parent, um, because it was uh, social distancing and you were not allowed um, to follow through. And so people would uh, die and all of the different rituals that we have for mourning could not happen. So in this project, once you send an image and it gets produced, at the end of it, we recover all the sand and then we start a new project. So this moment of erasure is a very important moment because it's what's supposed to give you closure. And for me, what's what's interesting is two things. One is the personalization of the, of the actual memorial. So we have over 700 memorials like this, web pages made for each participant with the videos and photos of what they did, but also, to make tangible the numbers, right? When we hear 7 million people have died due to COVID, we don't have a face behind it or a story. So how can uh, we create a way for people to mourn remotely? Um, and of course, this is not a replacement for a real wake or a ritual or a bereavement, but it does give you closure. And for me, uh, in this project, the, I lost two people due to COVID, and i found that because I was with my studio not being able to go anywhere, we just designed this sort of telepresence device to try and pe for people to participate and, uh, and, and have a, a proper homage, have some closure. Montaigne said that to philosophize is to learn how to die. And I think that art is a little bit like that. We, why do we make art? What is, what is the purpose of, of all of this art making? Is, is just to come to terms with the finitude of our own life. And, um, and while sig signaling mourning, we signal continuity. All of these portraits, all 700 and something, uh, are made with the exact same sand. Um, so the project is called A Crack in the Hourglass. And if you have lost somebody due to COVID, then we invite you to visit a crack in the hourglass.net or go to the Brooklyn Museum to, um, to, to try it out. And, uh, and it will give you a priority and it will show you your portrait uh, live as it's being drawn. So it's a like sort of mandala of uh, this uh, sand. So that's my presentation. I stop sharing and I believe that now it's time for some discussion. First of all, I want to thank you all. It's been an incredible, incredible panel. And the three of you have, I mean, each one has been so moving. It's just remarkable. Um, I would like to invite whoever is um, watching to please put your question in the chat and we will start our discussion that way. And meanwhile, I'm just going to ask a question to get us going. One of the things that seemed remarkable in each of your talks was the way in which, if you want, the digital coexists along with presence. And in every one of the cases highlights presence. So even like in Maria Jose's, which is perhaps the least obvious example of this, as I recall, Maria Jose, you sent out the invitation for participants on Facebook or in a tweet or using some media, right? You um, ask people to, to join and amazingly, you got your 1,200 people to do this. Um, with uh, Camus, I was, very touched by the virtual tour that you also give in um, at, um, I'm sorry, I have a COVID brain because I'm just kind of still getting over COVID. Um, but when uh, in Fighting Dark, that uh, you give that, that uh, digital tour and you said that people, you know, are participating in these walks and going to these places. And with you, Rafael, I mean, the, the, the technology is such a prominent part of what you do. Even the very, I love the, the low tech 
piece of Omara's breath, right, in a paper bag. So you have the high tech, you have the low tech, but it's all about presence. You know, right. it's all about the presence. So I just wondered if you, if the three of you have any reflections about how you think about the fundamental, maybe inseparability of the digital and presence and co-presenting in this moment. Let's start with, with Rafael because I see you here on the screen. Well, I mean, I think of the digital as something that's inevitable. I never work with technology because it's something new or original. I am, in fact, very enamored by the connections of anything that I'm doing to the people that I admire, people like Doris Salcedo or Rachel Whiteread or Hans Hakes, Christian Wodishko, Johan Gertz, Esther Shalif Gertz. So the artists who are working with the means of their time. And I think that... In the United States, I think you guys watch eight hours of screen time a day on average between mobile, TV, and internet. And so to pretend that that's not part of how the language of uh, works is, is, is strange. So I think that we, I use technology because like I said, it's inevitable. Um, what is more interesting to me is how can these memorials be connected to other ephemeral practices? I really liked uh, how Maria Jose spoke about you know, the performative as a fundamental way to remember or in, or in Kamahu's work, the idea of walking, you know, for the procession, like all of these rites are, are so fundamental. For me, the digital is secondary. It's just, it happens to be the, the, the means of our time. Um, but, but when it comes to mourning, I, I think that pretty much all cultures have like a sophisticated way to, 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 to say farewell and to have closure. The problem is that with the injustices of, of all of the subjects that the three of us have spoken about, there hasn't been that closure. There hasn't been that opportunity to really mourn and to really, you know, sort of see ourselves as, as doing, um, you know, uh, as doing it right. So I think artists try to fill in that gap uh, whenever they can. Thank you. Kamau, what would you say about that? About digital, I mean, well, just the way I mean, how do people react on the walking tours that are digital as opposed to the people that you're walking with on the streets? And yeah, I mean, um, I, I feel like actually uh, I have something relevant in front of me. I, I was talking to some um, students earlier about um, Afra Ben, who wrote this play. She was a uh, a spy for Charles II. She spied on the Dutch, um, and actually ended up spending some time in Suriname and met this African prince who was sold into enslavement. And she wrote a play about it, and it came out around like the same time as uh, the Glorious Revolution, so to speak. And it's sometimes hard to think about there being books in the world, but not being novels. But like novels is like an 18th century phenomenon. And so for people to actually have a play that's then turned into a book, to them that was digital, right? If your main method of having a conversation is theater, the idea of a book is like, well, why do a book? We have the stage. Whatever's next is is whatever's next. It's not necessarily like, you know, dark blue versus light blue. This is all something that we have in our lifetime, regardless to your age, regardless of how new it is. There are options. And so for me, it was some necessity. The initial idea for the walking tour fighting dark was for it to be an actual analog form of bipedalism guided but we wanted to find a way to make it work. And, and they had the bright idea to say, let's just do an evergreen example of it, make it an audio walking tour. And I was really touched when my friends in Brazil hit me up like, like I loved your walking tour. Like I sat in home and I listened to it. And you know, we, we often um, have these uh, comparisons of the cops here in the United States versus the cops in Brazil. And you know, un unfortunately it's, 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 it's a comparison of different types of extremes but like you know our cops are still a little worse than your cops but it's interesting to hear a conversation about police and black bodies in the 1800s in comparison to what's happening in 2020 um so so yeah i think that whatever's whatever's digital is is the same thing as whatever's next <laughs> thank you Maria Jose? yeah it's 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 so interesting because when i conceived like the when i conceived uh, I think that at the beginning, like when I was 
designing the performance, I thought of, of the digital just as a tool for recruiting participants. So we had this, uh, as you as you mentioned, this public call. We used social media. We had like ambassadors in social media that would help me uh, put the word out about the performance because, of course, I had like. I don't know, 20 followers in all my social media. So I had to recruit other people that had more followers. And I, I in my mindset back in 2013, I, I, was, I, I think I, I really thought in terms of the, the binary of presence and the digital. So for instance, at, the, at that time, I didn't want to have like an, an, an official archive of the performance because I was fixed that I wanted it to be something ephemeral because I, we were commemorating the desaparecidos. So I wanted something to appear in the city and then disappear in the city. So we didn't, you know, we didn't tell anyone, like we didn't tell journalists, we didn't, we didn't even like produce an official like a uh, register or document of the performance because I really wanted to be like ephemeral and, and, and had this phantasmagoric presence. But as always, performance teaches me a lot. And what I learned after Querer No Ver is that that binary is really, uh, it, it's, um, it's too restrictive and it's actually false because of the performance, like people that participated in Querer No Ver, they were there in presence in their body, putting their bodies on the line, but they were also taking pictures. With their cell phones and there were also live uh, like broadcasting the performance so that that i that that i was so concerned of not generating like an archive of the performance and just having this eph ephemeral nature actually it it became all the opposite because it has survived uh, 10 years afterwards because people but their participants or the witnesses or the people, the passerbys would create this digital archive of, was, of what was going on. So, yeah, I, I began with the very like binary mindset and coming from theater, I was fixed in just like preserving the presence uh, and doing something analog. But then, yeah, the performance, uh, we don't control what happens. And it really taught me that, you know, the, the digital, as Rafael says, is is what we are and what we do now too. So, so also like uh, thinking about this idea of like digitalized presence. Okay. So to follow up on that, um, I was really curious um, at how you conceptualize the ways in which you have stand-ins in all of your projects. So uh, the people lying on the street, Maria Jose are standing in or a, a, or accompanying or uh, imitating or identifying with the murder disappeared and Kamau, you have all these people in the present um, performing uh, characters from the past and becoming them and identifying with them. And Rafael, I've been so fascinated by how the sand is reused from one portrait to another to another. And I'm, so it made me wonder what does the sand remember of the previous portraits and how does the sand create a community where these people who have died are actually creating a community in death and in mourning and in remembrance. So I was wondering what you call that, um, those, that relationship. Is it a form of co-witnessing? It is a form of surrogation, uh, of um, identification. How can we conceptualize that also as an embodied form of repair? Can, yes, I can. Yeah. Uh, when I was uh, envisioning the project, all my like theater colleagues would tell me like, why don't you ask people to come like dressed in red? Imagine the drone picture, the drone photo in the in the city, like red, a red line. Or why don't you ask people like come into black clothes? And I really wanted to avoid that because I, I, I wanted to avoid like uh, thinking or doing the performance in terms of representation. I think that the, 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 the desaparecidos have like a very paradoxical status of not being there. They are not presence, present. So it would be really banalizing like representing that, them or doing like a, a fiction or a theater about the desaparecidos. So for me, the one, 1,297 people that participated in the performance were not there in the place of the desaparecidos, but they were in the place of themselves, 
of, of, of people of today that are doing this gesture and this action um, together, like in, in, in a collective practice. So I'm not sure like if I have a notion of how I would call it. I, I know I didn't want it to be a representation. I didn't want it to be mimetic. I didn't want to theatricalize like the missing or the, or the disappearance. Uh, I, I wanted to offer the possibility of, uh, of a collective assembled body and figuring out together. And, and that's what actually happened. We, we all discovered all this massive amount of people. We all discovered what we were doing when we actually did it. Uh, and and it's, it, it was really embedded in this idea of, of, of participation and, and, and collective creating a, a collective body that can imagine another future or reconstruct another past. Fabulous. Come on. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of anecdotes I can, um, I can share with you on that. Um, but I will say to give it like a simple, like description is I'm becoming less invested in this notion of, of, of linear time. I'm less invested in calendars and rectangles, uh, controlling the way I understand the world and how things move. And so when you ask somebody to step into the role of somebody who is in the past, who doesn't have um, an image in the archive, you're looking for energy. You're like, who, who matches the spirit of the person who I'm telling a story about? Or sometimes you're talking to somebody and you're like, wait a minute, you're giving me a particular type of energy that makes me think about a particular person who I want represented and the one story that I'll share is I asked somebody to play the role of Queen Nzinga of Angola, who is renowned for her just resistance as a military leader against enslavement in the, the um, colony of Angola by the, by the Portuguese in the 17th century. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's came back from the gym and she had her like little Afro, she had her arms out, we were like walking to the train I'm describing how I'm trying to find somebody to play Queen and Zynga. And I looked at her and I was like, actually, I think you would be great for that role. And she was just kind of like, um, I got to think about that. And I was like, okay. And then like, it took months. And when she got back to me, she was like, the reason why I had to wait is because I just lost uh, the matriarch on um, my maternal side. And my mother had already passed away. So with, with, the, lo with the loss of the matriarch, my, my, my level in the family bumped up because I was like now the oldest. Um, and when you asked me to play the role of a queen, it just hit me in my stomach. And I was just kind of like, it's, it's too much, right? And, and I also remember she also was the last slide that I showed. And when I used her image as a queen Anzinga, to talk about Angola and, and land ownership and reclaiming black space, that 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 week that she came to see the exhibit at the Oculus, she signed um, her first mortgage. She just bought her first property, and she goes, "So here I am coming to see this exhibition, but I'm also signing my first lease. I mean, I'm signing my first mortgage this week." And so when you when you stop thinking about things being like so linear, you understand that choices that you're making now are connected with this larger constellation that you only can see a day by at a time, but it doesn't mean that the future isn't already connected with the past. And so we're looking for people to step in and be a part of a conversation that's not dictated by a, a clock. Rafael, and then we have some audience questions as well. So um, tell me yeah. about the sand. Uh, I, I, I think that Participation is never neutral. When people take a stand and they participate, they are so doing something quite courageous, uh, especially in the context of, of what we're seeing. So I, I, what I think is, is that I set up some conditions and then the project is, it emerges from it. Sometimes it works. Uh, I think, you know, the work of Bosalta or the work across the US-Mexico border are strong, not because of what I, what I did, but because of the way that people made it theirs, the way that they personalized it, the way that it meant something to them. And so I often think 
part of the problem with a lot of what I do is that they're all ephemeral performances. And then what is the legacy? What stays? What remains? And so memory remains. Um, recounts of what happened remains. Uh, you establish a, 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 a new relationship to, for example, the border, as I was saying, a place for meeting instead of a place for being divided. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have any solutions. So all I'm trying to do nerdily is to set up platforms for people to, um, you know, to take over and, um, and learn from that. Uh, once the projects are, are on, you have to take, in my case, you have to take a step back and just let it happen and learn from it. Um, and that's also why you want to do it. You want to do it because, because you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Um, and and uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Well, I'm going to read a question from one of the participants, somebody on the screen tonight. This is from Lori Amy. And the question is for Kamau and Rafael. Quote, I am moved by the intersection of the body is an archive and healing isn't always pretty. And we know where the culprits are. They are in power. Could you speak to what the body might know that the mind blocks or blanks out and how that knowledge in the face of the culprits in power may be activated in and through art? Uh, love that question. Um, a, one of the ways that you can oppress a person, oppress their spirit, is to disrupt their rest, disrupt their time. If you're unable to meditate and have ceremony and be in dialogue with not only your ancestors, but just with energy and, um, you know, practice, you know, to, to, to be outside of your own skin, um, it's like, it's like uh, being... It's like not having eyesight, you know. Uh, it's like it's like being a, a sports team and not having the tape from your last game to, to learn from. And as much as we speak a lot about violence in the form of like um, taking things or oppressing people, even if you put away the actual weapons, I think there's something that happens violent with respect to economies that impact people's capacity to have the time to process and to think and to meditate and to rest and take long walks. And that is one of the ways that we're able to um, stand in the same place over centuries and have history repeat itself. But what it really is, are the systems are working well. And that's why history is repeating itself because we don't change enough because our evolution is stunted because we don't have opportunities to fully be human because we're so busy trying to do the next thing to buy things that Earth already gives us. And so when I think about healing not being pretty, it just means that you, you know you got to do it and there's a benefit from it. Um, but as somebody who like has seen childbirth, you know, my son's in his 20s now, but I'll never forget just like watching childbirth. And it's like, yo, something could be painful and beautiful at the same time, you know? And that's life. Sometimes things are messy and painful, but beautiful. And that's, 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 that's what healing is, you know? And so I don't know if I answered the question, but I hope I gave it my, my best. Awesome. It, it, it is, it is, it is a great question. It's a great okay. answer too. That was, that was beautiful. That was really great. Um, I would say invisibility, um, like, um, the body, the body, what, what does the body know that the mind blocks? Um, it, it knows cam camaraderie. It knows this idea of sharing, of, of sharing a space, sharing an atmosphere, sharing a land, sharing water, the commons. Um, the, body, the body is in relation always to others. And it, working at the U.S.-Mexico border was fascinating because we, for a small period of time, managed to completely forget about the wall. When I first went to work at the, at the, at the borderlands, people did not want to talk about the wall. They wanted to talk about what connections were already existing between the two sister cities and highlight that. And I thought that that was really interesting. Over and over again, I think that the artists make visible these hidden realities uh, that the body somehow knows. Um, and, uh, and so I would, I would say that the, the visibility. Thank you. Um, there's another question, Mariana, do you want to 
Well, I was hoping Maria Jose could answer this question as well. And I think then. You know. OK, it wasn't directed, but that doesn't matter. I think we should just everyone answer everything. That makes perfect sense. I think Mar you know what the body knows that the mind. You know, knows. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that uh, I would just like follow up with uh, what Rafael said in the sense that to me, what the body knows is like to resonate with like with others, with the space. Uh, so that's like one thing that like it's through this co-presence that we can really connect or what I said in, in my presentation, like uh, attune uh, affective uh, dispositions uh, of being together, like ways of being together. Uh, so yeah, that, I, I think that that's what the body knows that the mind. And also what the body knows, and this is something that, uh, creative work has taught me is that the body not knows but the body can ignore uh like the imperative of, of a linear time so the body knows other temporalities the body knows the temporalities of pleasure the of desire of of not doing anything of of resting and these are different ways of being in life and inhabiting the space and i think that that creating another temporality or uh, is offering the possibility of remembering or doing this memorial practice in another way so i i would also say like the body knows how to resonate with and the body knows how to escape this imperative of a linear time and to create invent other types of temporalities Love it. All these answers are so fantastic and they're so congruent with our project. Um, Rafael, you talked about an urban takeover. I think all three of you have uh, created urban takeovers with bodies who know so much more than everything that we're being told and who have brought this to the foreground so that we can participate together and create community. And I think the other thing you've shown us is that memory is an event and memorials are projects that continue not you know we've looked at built memorials but we've also looked at memory as ephemeral and as an event but that ephemeral but it then gets repeated over and over because we come to inhabit it in our bodies and create communities of memory and that's really what we've been trying to do in our project so um our co-organizers, Diana and I, are working very closely with Lori Novak, with Susan Micellis, and with Laura Wexler, who have conceived this project with us. We couldn't have hoped for a more generative roundtable and conversation here. So I want to close by inviting everybody to look at our website, zcmp.org, and to plan to come and join us on April 23rd for our public events in which we will be taking over uh, part, of, um, part of Upper Manhattan uh, with some joy and pleasure and commemoration. Um, Maria Jose will be doing a durational performance. Uh, we have uh, Rafael's A Crack in the Hourglass and Kamau, you must come and join us. We will drag you there. Um, and uh, at other times as well, we'll come and do one of your walks with you. So thank you all so much. Um, it's uh, been thank a you. pleasure. Thank you very much. We've enjoyed this immensely. Thank you. Thank you.